Uh, good morning. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church. Good to see you here. Let's stand together and sing Angels We Have Heard on High. Let's stand together and sing all four verses. Thank you, Pastor Eddie. Pastor Michael's on vacation, and we got a few others out too. And it looks like uh, I'm right here. I'm sorry, Pastor Halleck's on vacation. I said, "What, Pastor Michael?" Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm a little out of the loop. All right, um, and it's been quite the week. All right, um, most of you know, of course, that Dr. Collins Glenn, the pastor here for 45 years, went home to be with the Lord on Tuesday evening about 5:30. And that visitation will be here in the auditorium from 1 to 5 today, and the funeral's tomorrow at 11. And so um, it is going to be a little bit different of a service today. And also, um, we are going to have to cancel tonight's service. Uh, yeah, I got to thinking about um, jamming uh, the family up here about 5 o'clock and things. We were going to have Pastor Mike Backus preach for us tonight, Bethany Gunther's dad, um, and he graciously... Um, said that he would wait for next Christmas, all right? So I appreciate that, Pastor Backus, being here all the way from Montana just to preach Sunday night, and now he's not going to get to. But um, we, um, I think we'll have a different service today. I think you'll find that to be true. We do have the Lord's table uh, this morning as well for our uh, last Sunday of the month here, last Sunday of 2020. 
and so we'll celebrate that together as well. Welcome to each and every one of you. I hope you had a Merry Christmas. A lot of family is here today. Um, I know we have our live stream audience as well, and welcome to you as, uh, you as well. Um, I do have my brand new grandbaby, Felicity Bond, over here with Colin and Emma, and um, so she's a month old. And then the big surprise of Christmas was that my son Jared from South Korea got to come home Sunday night, and uh, that was a total surprise to us. Um, they kept it a secret from me, which is very difficult to do. And of course, him and Caroline got engaged then on Monday. And so we congratulate them. So he'll be coming home from South Korea um, in March, really, okay, the end of February, beginning of March, and he's going to be stationed in Kentucky with 101st, so at Fort Campbell there. So he'll be close, all right? So we, there's a lot to be thankful for, a lot of mixed emotions this week. I know you bring a lot of mixed emotions in with you even today as well. And so um, we'll go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing upon our time here together, and we'll remember the Glenn family as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus Christ to be born so that he could die for our sins. And Father, I pray that each one here today, each one of the sound of my voice would be able to understand the love that was involved in sending Jesus Christ to do that. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of eternal life that is ours by faith if we just simply ask. And so, Lord, I pray that there's one here today that doesn't know you as their own personal Savior. They will understand what the gospel is, and they would ask Jesus Christ to be their Savior. Father, I pray that you would be with the Glenn family today. Lord, Dr. Glenn pastored faithfully here for 45 years. He was our pastor emeritus for another eight. Lord, that's over 53 years that he was deeply embedded with this local church ministry that he he just took, and, and Lord, you blessed him, and you blessed this church, and we have what we have today because of it. And so, Father, I pray for Randy, for Anita, for the entire family, Lord, that you might just be with them in a very special way as um, they have the visitation, the funeral. Lord, may it bring honor and glory to you, and also honor to whom honor was due, your faithful servant, and our pastor, Collins Glenn. And so, Lord, we meet today to honor you, to lift you up, and Father, I pray that as we Observe the Lord's table today that we would also remember what it means to truly be saved, what kind of sacrifice there was involved with your death on the cross. And Lord, I pray that we might, as we meet together today, understand that as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated.
All right, let me look at just a few announcements here from the bulletin. If you don't have one, there are some at the information desk um, available for you. Of course, you can see on the bulletin that there's not a lot going on this week. There are a few things that are happening, but we aren't having the discipleship studies on Tuesday. There is no midweek service as well. And uh, the church office, though, will be open Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and half of Thursday. All right, church, church office open until noon on Thursday. Normally we do that in order for uh, last minute year in giving to come in. Um, if you want that to be um, for your tax purposes, uh, that does need to be brought in on Thursday or postmarked uh, on Thursday, December 31st in the mail. All right. I already announced that we're not going to have any evening service tonight. I'm really sorry about that, but I just want to give the family the liberty to be able to have uh, people here. I don't know exactly how many people will come uh, from 1 to 5 for the visitation, uh, but we do know that at Doreen's visitation, it was, it was backed up into the lobby still, trying to do it all in one day. So we did not want to do that. So that is why it is do, being done in the way that it's being done now. Of course, with the funeral tomorrow at 11. Uh, there will be a uh, a meal for the family tomorrow the hospitality committee is doing um, and uh, there's going to be a little bit of a brief time down the fellowship hall after the five o'clock hour here too for the family and friends that are gathered here from all over really the united states um, man let me remind you about our ifbf statewide men's meeting of course on january the 9th uh, we are having dr john wilkerson from first baptist hammond come and also dr bob the third both of these men will speak, and we are holding Dr. Bob III over on January 10th as well for both AM and PM service, so we're looking forward to having him, and um, I hope that you'll be in attendance to that, invite folks to come with you, especially um, we want our teen boys on up uh, that are invited to attend to be able to be here for that. Of course, we have lunch provided, a great breakfast down there as well, and so I hope you'll plan on making that. Um, just a kick off for your new year, if you would, please. There are tithe and offering envelopes in the fellow, in, I'm sorry, in the lobby, all right? Tithe and offering envelopes in the lobby. Um, if you don't find your name there and you haven't been assigned a number and you would like to have one, uh, please see Mr. Steve Scott, um, our financial controller, and he's around here somewhere, he's probably ushering. We're controlling something else. Okay, I'm probably counting those offering boxes up. But you see him, or you can call the church office. We'll get you uh, your own offering uh, box for that as well. All right. I think that's all the announcements that I have at this time. Let's sing another song. Let's stand once again and sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
I still love singing those Christmas carols. Emmanuel, God with us. That's the only way. That's the only way it could have happened. And uh, that's in God's plan of salvation, God's plan of redemption from eternity past. And I'm thankful for the fact that God came to dwell with men on earth. Let's have our ushers come at this time. We'll receive the morning offering, the last one of the year. We're going to have uh, Bethany and her brother Luke come and play the offertory. Looking forward to that. And let's pray as we receive this offering here this morning. Father, we thank you so much for what you have accomplished in our lives this year. We thank you for taking care of us during an unprecedented day and age in which we live in. We thank you for the faithfulness of God's people this year. And Lord, may you make us more faithful. May you help us, Father, to be able to be able to give more, be able to see the need, Lord, to be able to see that we can support more missionaries, to be able to see that we can do more here at home. Lord, I pray that you might just continue to guide and direct. We thank you for the, um, just the gifts that have come in, Lord. And Father, I pray that you might just continue to guide and direct in the use of those monies. We pray, Father, that it would be used for your honor and glory and that we might worship you this morning as we give. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Bethany and Luke, for that offertory. Let's remain seated as we sing our last hymn, O Come, All Ye Faithful.
have a special by Rachel Wallace. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate that very much. All hope was gone when Jesus came, changed everything. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. I had just determined on Tuesday what I would be preaching here this morning. I was waiting for... Um, some of Dr. Glenn's grandkids have come down to the church office and they need to use some Wi-Fi and some things like that. Got to be about 6 o'clock on Tuesday and I said, hey, I'm leaving the office. I said, but here's the Wi-Fi password. I gave it to him. And Randy texted back. He said, Dad just passed. So I went up to the house and I knew he was coming home or they were going to try to get him home from Indy Hospital. And I think that was a rough trip coming up here. Hospice had set up a bed in their living room, and I think about half hour after they got him into that bed, he passed. He wanted to be home. 
If you would have told me 23 years ago we'd be standing here today about to lay to rest. This servant of the Lord and that we'd all be here, I told you you're crazy. I thought the Lord would come back before I was 30. Came here at 28. I just didn't think I could preach the message that I had in plan for today. I also want to give the funeral home time here for the family to come in and have their time. I'll be saying more about that after the Lord's table here. A lot of you have come, this mic's a little bit hot. A lot of you have come in the last eight years to Grace Baptist Church. And you know who Dr. Glenn is. You may have heard him preach once or twice, but there's a lot of people here that don't know him. Maybe a lot of our online crowd that didn't know him. I read in 2 Kings chapter 13, Second Kings chapter 13, verse 14. Now Elisha, great prophet of God, great servant of the Lord. Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness wherever he died. Dr. Glenn, three weeks ago, drove himself to the hospital. Three o'clock in the morning, I had a heart attack. That's how he was, that's how he rolled. Wouldn't call us, wouldn't get us out of bed, nothing. No, he wouldn't do that. They confirmed he had a heart attack. They sent him to the Indy Hospital. He got home, never felt right. I talked to him two Saturdays ago at the bottom of his driveway where he was getting his mail, crossing Nebo, stopping traffic, getting his mail. He had a heart attack a week ago. Still didn't feel right. told him that day I'd take him to the hospital again if he wanted to and he didn't want to go. Later on that week he got a hold of Dr. Ice and Dr. Ice took him down to the hospital and there he stayed until he came home and passed on Tuesday. I didn't know he was sick of the sickness whereof he would die. There would have been a lot more things I would have done. A lot more conversation I would have had with him. A lot of things I would have done, but I didn't know. The doctor said the first time, no reason why he won't live a few more years. That wasn't to be. Elisha was falling sick of the sickness wherever he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Say, what are we going to do? This can't be. What are we going to do now? Elisha wasn't having any of it. He ignored it. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. I'll bring this to a close by going back into here. But Elisha said unto him, take bow and arrows, get busy. And he took unto him bow and arrows, and he said to the king of Israel, put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it, and Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. Man, that's great. And he said, open the window eastward, and he opened it. Then Elisha, Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, that is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. He was telling him what he wanted him to do. At that point in Israel's history, Syria was a major, major enemy of the nation of Israel. 
and they could have wiped them out. But God said, Elisha, I want you to tell Joash the king that he's going to give you the victory. Even though this is the last thing that Elisha is going to do here on this earth. He said, Joash, don't worry about me. I'm immaterial. He says, open that window, shoot an arrow out of it. That is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. You're going to defeat Syria. You're going to get the victory. And he said, take the arrows to the king. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And he smote three times and stayed. He stopped. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hadst consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. And Elisha died and they buried him. Hey, Pastor Roy, what does all this have to do with Dr. Glenn? Well, let me tell you something about Dr. Glenn. God used him in a great way. We don't even know. We don't even know. I found out yesterday that the family wants me to deal with the obituary tomorrow and I had already planned on saying a few words here this morning. I don't know exactly what I'll do. I didn't know I was going to get a chance to say something at the funeral, really, other than welcome to everybody and sit down, which is what I would expect to do. There's a lot of guys going to be here, a lot of preachers that knew him, family, friends. A lot of guys could be here talking about him. But I want to tell you about what I knew about him. I want to tell you what I knew about him how God used them in my life. I know what God did here. Many are here that are saved because of the ministry that Dr. Glenn had, whether it was dispensational home Bible studies or personal soul winning, going to the hospital, knocking on your door, preaching the word of God from this pulpit. That's what he was all about. When I first came here in 1997, I had three kids. Colin was here, he was four. Alex, my second, he was three. And Drew, who is on the naughty list right now because he didn't come home for Christmas, was nine months old. We let Drew stay with Doug and Karen Stein, who later on came to be associate pastor here. And we went and came over here to see what this church was all about because he had called me up that summer of 1997 and said, I need a youth pastor. I said, I'm not interested. Not interested. Happy where I'm at in my home church. Appreciate the call. He said, well, if you're ever over in Muncie, I said, well, how far is that from Anderson? Because I'm coming to see my old emphasis really on old youth pastor, Doug Stein. He's in Anderson. He goes, well, Anderson's 20 minutes from us. Why don't you come see us? I said, I might. I didn't know nothing. We came over here. We couldn't find anybody at the church here. The offices were across the street. Who does that? We, not, we, we checked every door trying to get in this place. I'm like, this is a big place. There's got to be somebody here. I think it was Anita. It might have been Anita that found us. Who was it? It was Joanna Davis. Found us and told us, oh, you got to go across the street. That's where the offices are. I'm like, what kind of joint is this? <laughs> so we go over there, walk in. I'm Rory Bond, 28 years old, hotshot youth pastor from Pekin, Illinois. My first remembrance of him was his smile, how he set you at ease, took to my kids. He was 63, 64 years old at the time. He was photogenic, man. Wasn't he photogenic? Never aged till recent. He took Amy and I and kids all around the property. Of course, the pews were orange. That was a mark against. But 
But I looked at Amy, I said, we're way out of our league here, we gotta get out of here. Drove up in a van with the paint falling off. Something wrong with the exhaust, it was smoking like some wood burning stove. He showed us all around and told us a little bit and he said, you had lunch yet? I said, oh, no, but we had the kids, four and three, and we were like, no, no. And he said, let's go up here to Sirloin Stockade, where I noticed that the man could tear up a chicken like none other. He loved that Sirloin Stockade. And it went on from there. We came in August of 97. Didn't have any idea what the Lord had in store. Like I said, if you would have told me at that point what we'd be doing right now, I'd have told you you're crazy. Let me tell you something I knew about him. He was unruffled. Unruffled, calm. Never did I see him get nervous. Never saw him get animated. Never saw him get... Um, crazy like I do. He was unruffled. Never raised his voice. Some people saw that as him dragging his feet sometimes, but he wasn't dragging his feet ever. He was calculated. He never assumed anything. He took me to a debate once with, that he was asked to go to over at the uh, Indiana uh, Smart Kids School there at Ball State. Academy for Math and Science or whatever they call it. There were like three preachers up there and they were debating God and stuff like that. And there was a Catholic priest up there, I think, and some other guy and, and Pastor Glenn. And I sat on the front row and he's got a hostile audience already. I, I've never seen anybody debate like he debated because he really didn't debate. He listened. He let all those other people dig themselves into holes. And when he spoke, they clapped for him. I was like, he's got him eating out of the palm of his hand. That's how he was. He was unruffled. He listened. And then he spoke. I got to get through these. What else do I know about him? He loved his people. He loved the Lord's church. He did. He loved his people. Day or night, he wouldn't come in and say, I was up all night with a family at the hospital. He wouldn't come in and say, hey, you know, I was praying. But if you listened to what he said, you knew what he, where he'd been. You could fill in the blanks, put the pieces together on the family. He'd been with them all night. He'd come when you called. And some of you knew that. But unless you're the ones that called, you never would have known it, what hours he kept. In the office early, he was an early riser, hardly slept. But he loved his people. It was his calling. It was his calling. It wasn't something he showed up to do. He didn't punch a clock. I know this about him, he always prayed. If you went for a meeting with him and you had a problem, you had an issue, he prayed. Before you left, let's pray. Let's pray. These are some things I learned from him. He always looked to the Lord to handle problems. I know how he did. He'd meet a problem and he'd just pray about it and God would take care of it. I saw it time and time again. He prayed like few people I know. He was humble. You know, I saw him hang with politicians, national leaders on the church front. He did stuff down in Indianapolis back in the day. Sat on boards. But at the end of the day, that wasn't him. That wasn't him. He'd sit on boards with these men who might have been self-important, but that wasn't him. I've been on boards with him. And once again, he listened a lot, talked little. But when he talked, 
he said something and everybody agreed. He was down to earth. I like this about him too. He never thought he was above learning from others. He'd talk about the early days of ministry, how he'd go and listen to G.B. Vick and others who built great churches and great works. He'd go and spend weeks with those guys. He got their books. He continued to get emails from people and he was on people's um, lists for, for, so that he could learn things, tidbits during the week. He never thought he was above learning, although the guy was one of the most learned men in the Bible that I have ever met. He didn't talk much about himself. People castigated him about that from the pulpit because he wouldn't use personal illustrations and things. And I do remember listening to him preach. And when he would say something about back in the day, I'd sit up and listen. I wanted to know because it was very few times that he talked about himself. I remember one time I found out that he had been in the National Guard. And I said, well, National Guard? I said, well, what'd you do? He goes, I was the BAR man, the bar man. Now, for those of you that know, he didn't go bar hopping. That's the Browning automatic rifle. They just didn't give that to anybody. Usually every squad or platoon or somebody like that, some, some um, breakdown of the, of the uh, group there would have somebody carrying a BAR. He said, I was that. I said, well, you never told me. He said, and he told me this a lot, you never asked. I'm, I'm like, how am I supposed to know to ask? I didn't ask. But that's what he would tell you all the time because he never told you anything personal about himself. He was a humble guy. He was proud of Randy and Anita. He didn't talk about them a lot. He talked about him more in later years. But man, he was proud of him. Loved his family, loved his in-laws, loved his grandkids. He was very proud of the grandkids. He understood God's word like few others I've known. Put it all together. He saw the big picture, and that's what he used with his dispensational home Bible studies. When I was a preacher boy down at Bob Jones University, he was one of the featured speakers and he came into class and showed us what he did with dispensational home Bible studies. Little did I know that in a few years I'd be working underneath him, watching him, learning from him. He knew how to put it all together and give you the big picture. Many, many people got saved from that. What I liked about him is he never got shook about prophecy. I'd come to him and say, hey, did you see what in the news going on? He'd say, ah, don't worry about that. Nothing's going to happen there. Man, you couldn't shake him. I stopped doing it. Like, man, um, he's not into conspiracies, you know. Always down to earth, though. He was funny, you know. That Glenn Grin, right? He was good with people. He could put you at ease right away. First thing you'd notice was that he dressed like a million bucks. What you didn't know is he spent 10 bucks on it. Remember the first time he came to my office, he said, let's go slumming. That's what he called it. He said, you want to go slumming? I go, what's that? He goes, come on, I'll show you. So we go slumming to Goodwill. He goes into this Goodwill before they built the new one. He walked in there like he owned the place. He reached behind the counter, grabbed a measuring tape, and we went to town in Goodwill. He's measuring everything. He's measuring me. He's measuring all these suit coats and everything. Couldn't find nothing for me. But man, could he find stuff for him. For his birthday, for Christmas, if you got him a $10 gift card to Goodwill, he was happy. He was overjoyed. We went to the Indianapolis Goodwills. He knew where every one of them were. Every one of them. And then we go to lunch. He was approachable. Door was never shut. If I wanted to go talk to him, I just went in and talked with him. He could be studying. 
you could sit down and talk with him. Very rarely, unless there was something going on or a counseling session that his, was his door ever closed. Very approachable. Went to lunch whenever we wanted to go to lunch. And sit down with him whenever we could sit down with him. He was a man of integrity. I watched his life. I worked under him for 15 years and I've been with him into 24 years. I watched his life. He never lied to me. I'm not saying the man was perfect because I realized he had faults, he made mistakes. He wouldn't want you to think that. He was human, but he never lied to me. I could never catch him in a lie. No, I know of no scandal. Of course, I was with him in later years, but I know of no scandal that followed him. For a man to be in the ministry over 50 years and not to have a scandal like that, that's impressive in our day and age. Tell you this about him. He never let you see the hurts. He never let you see the knife wounds. He bore it all silently. He never came to me and said this or that about people or families that would leave. Say things about him. He never said nothing. He never defended himself. I never heard him defend himself one time. It's hard. It's hard. I would talk to Doreen. She'd talk to me. And just from the things that she told me, I could put the puzzle pieces together and said, he hasn't told her nothing about this situation or that situation. I'm sure they talked. Not the things she talked to me about. He bore it. And I'll tell you this, he never quit. You know that. His favorite verse, right? Put your hand to the plow and don't look back. He never quit. The most surprising thing I saw when I first came here and blew me away was that he had staff meeting on Monday morning at 8 o'clock. I was like, um, most, most preachers take Monday morning off. He goes, not me. He goes, man, I hit the ground running every Monday morning. I'm like, you're crazy. Okay. Most preachers um, on Monday morning are in fetal position underneath their desk sucking their thumb because of whatever happened on Sunday. Okay. Somebody said something to them or you know, they got a phone call or whatever, and they need Monday just to stay sane, not Dr. Glenn. Monday morning at 8 o'clock, we're in his office, we're having staff meeting, and he put up with us and our shenanigans. Oh. One time, we got a little rowdy. I don't remember what it was. There were some turf wars or something going on. As can happen, although we had good staff. We've always had good staff. Staff before I got here was kind of crazy, but that we had a good staff. And I remember the only time I ever got in trouble was we all got in trouble. And he wrote us a, a note. He wrote us a note. It's in the bottom drawer of my desk still. I get it out and read it sometimes, just stay humble. He said, y'all need to behave. Basically, that's what it said. When we all got those letters, we all stood around and we were like, it feels like we just got spanked. It wasn't mean. Subtle. In the Glenn way, but we knew what he meant. He settled down. But he never quit. And when he retired in 2012, February... He sat here for a couple of weeks until Dunkirk called him to come up here and help us. And he was there. For eight years, he drove up to Dunkirk through Albany 
risking traffic tickets. It was Albany cops. Eventually, they just waved at him. They weren't going to chase him no more. And he went up to Dunkirk, and for the last eight years, he's been plowing that ground up there. But he never quit. And I think he was out of the pulpit two weeks, maybe three. I'd have to check with Randy. And God took him home. I read you this verse in 2 Kings, and I could go on and on with this kind of thing. These are some of the things I wrote down, and now I'm thinking about all kinds of stuff I should have put in there. But you know why Joash came to Elisha and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Because look back in 2 Kings chapter 2. These are famous words that Elisha himself said. 2 Kings chapter 2. The Bible says in verse... Let's look in verse 9. And when it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah, the prophet Elijah, said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. The final thing that God had to do with Elijah, he said, Go find Elisha and let him take over your work. The Bible says that Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and taught. That behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. He saw him no more. When it became apparent in 2011 what was going on here at Grace Baptist Church and the transition and things like that, I knew I wasn't worthy to succeed him. Never will be. Never will be. I'm not being self-deprecating, folks. I'm just saying it ain't possible. But I'll tell you this. Elisha said those words when Elijah went up into heaven. My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. What am I going to do? When it came time for Elisha to die, the king knew those words. Those were famous words. And he said the same thing to him. But I know this, that God's work continues to go on. God wants the church to have victory. God wants us to have success. And we're going to keep on plodding on. We're going to keep moving forward. It doesn't matter what next year holds. It doesn't matter what happens. God is for us. If Dr. Glenn, we bury him tomorrow and I die the next day, God will raise somebody up to continue this work. Because this is his church. I will always be thankful for what he did for me. I always be thankful for how he mentored me without mentoring me. He just watched him. I'll sit in my office and I'm like, that's exactly what Dr. Glenn would have done. Because he had an impact on my life. He had an impact on your life. Even if you never knew him, I guarantee you because of him and how he let the Lord use him. He sacrificed his life for this church and we are the benefactors of that. 
in just a few minutes. The mortuary is going to wheel his body in here, the shell that he lived in. I'm going to set him right before this pulpit that he preached at for so many years. People are going to come pay their final respects. Try to say nice words to the family. Find it within ourselves to express our condolences. Those are appreciated. But I'll tell you this. You want to honor Dr. Glenn's memory? And when God gives you the arrows, the arrow of God's deliverance, don't stop. Don't stop smiting. Joash didn't really understand, I think. Smote the ground three times with the arrows. And he stayed. I've seen a lot of people have victory nigh, almost there. And they stopped short of what God wanted for them. Dr. Glenn never stopped short. He finished his course. He kept the faith. And there's a crown of righteousness laid up for him. And not for him only, but for all them also that love is appearing. We don't stop until Jesus comes, amen? We don't stop. And that's my challenge to us today. Say, what are we going to do? We're going to keep going. We're going to see God work a victory. Dr. Glenn wanted to see this church continue on. I don't know exactly why God entrusted it to me. I don't sometimes. A lot of inadequacy there sometimes. But God's not done with anybody. God's definitely not done with Grace Baptist Church. And so we lay to rest a servant of the Lord. That's what he wanted to be called. He wouldn't want the accolades. He'd, he'd be pretty mad probably. We know. And I want to do the family right. In just a second, why don't we have the, usher, the uh, deacons come for the communion this morning. The sacrifice that was made by Dr. Glenn as a servant of God here is because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And we honor that and memorialize that here this morning on this last Sunday of 2020. Deacons, go ahead and come. We remember Christ's sacrifice, what he did for us on the cross. And as we come to this time, I know that the mortuary will be coming soon. We want to give the family as much time from 12 to 1 as possible. I know that some of you will go get a bite to eat and come back at 1. That's fine. Some of you will want to hang around at church. That's fine too. But give the family space in here, okay? Give the family space in here. Don't start the thing at noon or before, okay? Let them have time in here. They didn't ask me to say this. I know how visitations work, okay? You know who you are if you're the early one at 10 till, all right? I'll get there before anybody else. No, let them have their space. Let them say their goodbyes. And then we'll start at one, okay? With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, Search your heart this morning. The Bible says, as Paul relates to the Corinthians, we ought to examine our hearts, judge ourselves, lest we be judged. The Bible says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily or in an unworthy manner eats and drinks damnation. That word is condemnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 
Discerning the Lord's body has to do with what he did for us on the cross when he shed his blood and his body was broken for us because of our sin, because of my sin. And so we come to this time as a church body, those that are saved, this is for you to remember Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made. And so I'll give you a few minutes of silent prayer and examination, and then we'll proceed. We thank you for this time together that the church body can meet. We remember with grateful hearts the servant of God that you sent here so long ago to build this church, to preach, to teach, to care, to shepherd, to love. Sacrifice that he made to this church is immeasurable. But Lord, he did it because of the sacrifice that you made, because of the gospel. Because of your death, your shed blood, your broken body, so that we could have eternal life. That was the message that he preached, and that's the message that we're going to continue to preach and that we show in this memorial service here today. So, Lord, I pray that we would come to it with hearts that are open to your word, conscience that is cleared. We come to it discerning the Lord's body. Not treating it flippantly. Not treating sin flippantly. But Lord, a very, very serious time. We come to this moment. We thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. As we have been doing during the pandemic, we're going to have you stand at this time. Those that want to partake, you don't have to. This is for Christians. This does not convey grace or anything like that. This does not get you saved. Okay, but we want you to stand and come to the nearest aisle, and then you can partake. There's juice and bread in two cups there. Okay, take the two cups, take it back to your seat, and we'll read the scriptures. First Corinthians 11, Paul says, 
For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Verse 25 says, After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. We celebrate this the last Sunday of the year. Some folks do it the first Sunday of the year. We do it the last Sunday of each month. So we come together as a family to remember the Lord's death, his burial, his resurrection. And we are thankful for it. This is the gospel. Don't forget. The Lord knows that as human beings we have short memories. So go forth, remembering what he's done for you. If you're not saved, he died for you. He shed his blood for you. His body was broken for you. And as I pray here and we close our service, have our final song, remember what he's done for you. Be joyful in that, but never forget the price that was paid for our salvation. Let's pray. Father. Thank you for the time together today. We thank you for the remembrance here of the Lord's table, the remembrance of our pastor who faithfully served here. It's a day of remembering. So, Father, I pray that you might be with each heart that is heavy, but it's not a normal Sunday. Our hearts are heavy. We grieve with those who grieve. Thank you for the life that was Dr. Collins Glenn, for what he accomplished here. We thank you for Jesus Christ and for his life, for his death. Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, might we never forget what you've done for us and be grateful, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll have our final song. Let's stand together and sing that uh, chorus of O Come, All Ye Faithful.